So our presentation today is called Data Feminism and Protest Literacy, the student faculty led March with us project and it concerns the experience of co creating this project, uh, which is really about hidden histories of the civil rights era and our perspectives from a teacher's perspective and a student's perspective of class in developing this project. Um, before we begin, we really want to thank today's translators and the Global um, Humanities Symposium for this opportunity to share our work. So our use of the term protest literacy comes from our oral history interviews with more than 13 alumni and emeritus faculty, one of whom, uh, an emeritus professor of sociology at San Jose State, who put American society on trial in one of his San Jose State classes, emphasizes the need to teach protest as part of general education, since organizing su successful protests requires skills. Our project doesn't teach how to organize protests, but it does seek to create related and accessible teaching resources. The term data feminism in our presentation's title is borrowed from Lauren Klein and Catherine Diagnazio, two scholars who argue for cultivating more inclusive digital humanities projects by prioritizing a series of inclusive, inclusive aims, such as making all project labor visible, including the labor of student collaborators. And here you see the student collaborators that have given permission to use their names. Um, it's also the case that um, they encourage creating projects that highlight exclusion of women and other groups from the historical record. They also suggest um, advancing research that takes into account affect or what bodies feel and experience, such as the labor triumphs and traumas of student activism and researching the history of 1960s activism today. Pursuing projects that examine power and aspire to empowerment is another one of their um, suggestions and other methods as well. In teaching the class, um, I had a number of priorities. Um, one was empowering students to produce original and archival research that expands knowledge in the humanities and engages in institutional critique. I also wanted to teach students about campus history by means of self-discovery, such as exploring 1960s primary sources and seeing connections to our lives today. I also wanted to identify, and when we started doing that, to amplify excluded voices and histories. Indeed, we're committed to compiling and sharing open access data sets, as well as interviewing alumni and emeritus faculty to capture a wider spectrum of the campus's 1960s history, honoring both famous moments of protest and the intersectional labor of day-to-day -day student activism. We are committed to amplifying what one alumna describes as her foot soldier experiences of protest involvement at San Jose State, recognizing that foot soldiers are essential to any movement and critical for the organizers fighting against a range of issues in the 1960s, from institutionalized racism to the Vietnam War draft. If you're not familiar with San Jose State's role in the civil rights movement, this aerial photograph taken on October 16th at the winner's podium of the 1968 Mexico City Summer Olympics shows two of San Jose State's student athletes, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who were 24 and 23 years old at the time. They became champions winning the gold and bronze medals in the 200 meter dash and used their moment of international fame to show defiance of powerful institutions that perpetuated injustice, including San Jose State and the Olympics. Facing death threats in the year that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, they bravely took off their shoes, bowed their heads, and raised glove fists, drawing attention to systemic racism and exploitation through the poses of their bodies and what they were wearing. They were supported in that moment by active membership in two important groups organized at San Jose State in 1967, United Black Students for Action and the Olympic Project for Human Rights, both of which were co-founded and led by a charismatic young sociology professor and former San Jose State student athlete named Dr. Harry Edwards who was then in his mid twenties and already an international civil rights protest organizer, PhD candidate at Cornell University and an adjunct professor at his alma mater, San Jose State. 
Smith, Carlos, and Edwards were part of a community at SJS that achieved other important institutional reforms. While not as famous as the Olympics protest, student and faculty gained national attention in the late 1960s for a series of boycotts, walkouts, teach-ins, and rallies that resulted in desegregation of campus sororities and fraternities, the Educational Opportunity Program, which still supports first-generation college students across California, the Chicano graduation walkout, now an annual commencement event, two of the earliest African-American studies in Chicana and Chicano studies departments in the country, among other important legacies whose stories few SJSU students and only some SJSU faculty know. Student faculty activism continues to reform the campus. As I learned with my students last fall, Victory Salute, a monument at San Jose State created by the artist Rigo 23 in 2005 to honor Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and the Olympic Project for Human Rights, as well as to encourage student activism, was constructed through the labor of late 1990s and early 2000s students and faculty activism. Although widely used in campus marketing materials, insiders share that the money to build the monument came from students and that faculty and students had to fight to place this monument at the center of campus. The work to organize, fund, and promote an annual event to commemorate this historic protest and monument remains the voluntary responsibility of faculty rather than an ongoing commitment from university administrators, which we hope will change. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself and should quickly share what happened a year prior when the March With Us project began. In the two hours and 45 minute seminar held in a building called Clark Hall just opposite these statues, I surveyed DH literature with students and reproduced and expanded a data set that catalogs a collection of digitized 1960s photos of campus protest made available on the university library's website. We actually couldn't go to look at in things in person during the COVID-19 lockdown. From the library's website, we copied over the photos titles, other published data and metadata, and began adding to it. If you'd like to see the photos students analyze, they're available on the SJSU Special Collections website, and I'll link that in the chat after we're done. Excuse me for interjecting. Could you just yes. slow down just a bit for our interpreters, please? Sure. I'm so sorry. No <laughs> Get excited and start talking quickly. I'm sorry. Um, the first final project proposal and presentation in fall of 2021 demonstrated how digital humanities tools could tell a geolocated story of campus. We use digitized historic photos, archival research, and a physical scavenger hunt across campus to identify and validate the sites where important protests took place, comparing historic photos with surviving campus buildings. Samantha Valencia, a transfer student new to campus that fall, coined the project's title, March With Us, to highlight the way in which histories we were uncovering and the potential walking tour we were envisioning invited acts of solidarity in today's students. On the map on the left, you see a 1960s photograph of campus that the students and I annotated using stars that mark important sites of campus activism in the 1960s. And on the right, you see a diagram that the students brainstormed charting a path through these locations. Olivia joined the class the following semester and became one of the students seeking to, re to create something more than a walking tour. So our project proposal um, ended up looking different from the previous semesters because we felt that a walking tour wasn't activist enough. Initially, Professor Oaken assigned the class to look through the Spartan Daily, which is our campus newspaper, to explore the year 1968 when Tommy Smith and John Carlos protested at the Mexico City Olympics. My class brainstormed keyword search terms coming up with protest, demonstration and riot, but it soon became apparent that the demonstrations in 1968 were the height of attention to social justice causes, but they didn't show the protesters years long labor to build momentum in those movements. By expanding our search to 1965 to 1969, we were able to put together a much fuller picture of what fighting for civil rights at San Jose State entailed and created a timeline of those major events. 
as we saw the beginnings of the Black, Chicano, and anti-Vietnam War movements through the headlines, we started homing in on particular activist groups. So through research, um, I started to notice names that kept coming up, and there was one name in particular, Ira Meltzer, um, and it would lead to over a dozen interviews with alumni. So you couldn't really look through Spartan Daily search results for words like protest without his name being mentioned. Ira was a troublemaker. He was president of the radical anti-war group Students for a Democratic Society, and he planned several demonstrations on campus that drew national attention. When I told Professor Okin that he was still alive, she Googled his name, found a phone number, and we called him. And his interview was our first and the start of the oral history portion of this project. We wanted to put together a timeline of campus activism in the late 1960s and fill in the gaps with, um, from the Spartan Daily and other archival sources with their lived experiences. And we were able to switch the focus of the project to oral history because of the flexibility that Professor Oaken built into the course and her empowerment of students to make this project our own, leveraged our skills and interests to create what we felt was a more activist research project. So um, when we were looking for more names of protesters to interview, we noticed how few women were named or quoted in the school paper when it came to campus demonstrations. Um, and activism at San Jose State was not solely the work of men, but because of uh, the journalists at the school at the time when they were looking for people to interview or photos of demonstrations, um, they focused mostly on men, even if a woman was in charge of a protest group, such as Norma Fierro, who was vice president of the Chicano Activist Group Student Initiative in 1967. Um, and because of uh, how few women showed up in these archives, we decided it was very important to elevate women protesters who were marginalized in the preservation of campus history. Um, so Margaret Ailey is, uh, she's a fantastic alumna that we wish we had gotten the chance to interview. Um, unfortunately, uh, she passed in the early 2000s, but uh, her story speaks to San Jose State's connection to larger civil rights history she went to the South in 1964, where she helped register Black voters. She lived with June Johnson's family, and she stayed there until um, she and other uh, workers were forced out uh, due to the danger to them. And she came back to San Jose State and made it her mission to create a more just society by educating white people um, and uh, creating watchdog groups for local government meetings to treat uh, minority communities more fairly. Mary, if you wanna read the last slide, you can. Okay. We are on time. So if you just wanna wrap this last slide up, we'll also have time for the questions as well. Okay, great. Um, so we have so much more to say, um, but our project uh, is really intended to center student experiences, which I hope you got from this. Um, so much of 1960s history at our campus, at least, seems to be told from the perspective of the institution um, and its administrators. And so we feel that foot soldier story, um, the sto story of women and others who've been excluded is really important. Um, we're really delighted that we've received um, support for um, part of this project to just recently um, from the University of Houston's Recovering U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program, um, which is going to help us work with uh, alumni of the Chicano um, student movement on campus to um, create um, annotated primary sources that um, correct some of the inaccuracies in Spartan Daily Reporting, for example. Um, I just want to end with a quote from one of our alumni uh, who said after hearing Olivia's classes, a final presentation, quote, 
Uh, on, the un on the one hand, I feel really encouraged that the new fascism is not going to be easy for the right. And at the same time, there's a battle looming so that 2022 feels like 1967 currently. So it's amazing how you've been able to make that connection, end quote. Um, we really look forward to continuing to work on making such connections and to helping preserve a more accurate uh, 1960s campus history record in collaboration with alumni uh, and emeritus faculty. And it is my hope that other educators and students who haven't yet turned to their 1960s elders might consider doing so as well. Thank you.